Thanks. So thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I uh, am really happy to be giving the first talk in this uh, CTG seminar series this year. Um, I also wanted to take this uh, time to thank the CTG for awarding me the Jack Henderson Prize for Best PhD Thesis. Um, and because I've been, I feel like in the last year I've been presenting my PhD work over and over again, and the last time I presented it was um, at GACMAC, I thought today I would maybe talk about something a little bit different and uh, talk about the work I've been doing at MPIE over the last year. Uh, but before I do so, I do want to give a brief um, synopsis of what I did for my PhD. So for my thesis, I applied high spatial correlative microscopy to interrogate the feedbacks between deformation and diffusion processes in pyrite. So more specifically, um, one of the first projects that I worked on, I was studying the influence of crystal plastic deformation on trace element mobility. So more specifically, I was looking at how deformation in orogenic deposits could lead to the remobilization of metals within pyrite. Um, so this work was, uh, was published in a paper in Contributions to Mineralogy and Petrology. And then in the second half of my thesis, I focused on studying the influence of fluid inclusions on the rheology of pyrite. So this work was one of the first studies or the first study to document fluid inclusions through atom probe tomography in minerals. Um, and this data actually allowed me to document two processes that um, led me to propose a new model by which fluid inclusions or fluids had a hardening effect on minerals or more specifically on pyrite. So this was in contrast to the more commonly reported weakening or softening uh, effect that fluids typically have on minerals. So this work um, was published in both ultramicroscopy and contributions to mineralogy and petrology. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, I strongly encourage you to look at these papers, but I'm always happy if you reach out to me and ask me any questions um, about this data. Um, but since I've uh, moved to Germany and started my work at MPIE, I've been applying the same analytical approach. However, this time I'm looking mostly at garnet. Um, the reason for this is, as we all know, garnet is everywhere. Um, it's a common rock forming mineral and it can occur in various mineral assemblages um, and different rock types throughout the Earth lith lithosphere. And um, so it occurs at a wide range of PT conditions. So I like to show these ternary plots here because um, they really show how uh, garnet can have various compositions so they can form solid solutions between the various end members um, or the pure end member compositions. And here we can, it shows uh, how these compositions occur in various rock types. So we can see they occur in high magnesium peolites, um, in granites, as well as uh, uh, Ophiolite series and uh, anything from amphibolite facies rocks to granulite facies rocks. So one of the reasons why garnet is everywhere um, is because it has a very large stability field. So its stability field can range from anywhere from 300 degrees Celsius to nearly 2000 degrees Celsius and one to approximately 25 gig gigapascal. Um, so one of the this is also one of the reasons why garnets is, uh, is commonly used in lasers, because it can sustain such high temperatures. Um, in addition to this, garnet is also considered to be a fairly high strength mineral um, because it can retain its microstructure as well as its chemical composition during deformation and metamorphism. Because of this, um, garnet is commonly used as a petrological tool. So we can look at the major and trace element compositions of garnets to, uh, to use for a wide range of geothermal barometers uh, and geochronometers. And these can be combined for geospedometry. So this can allow us to obtain pressure, temperature, and time constraints on tectonic events. So here I just show um, just two uh, examples of how uh, garnet can be used as a petrological tool. 
So for geochronometry here, we can see that we can use, we can look at the samarium niodymium uh, isotope ratios for geochronology. Um, and for geothermobarometry, we can look at the mineral inclusions within garnet to determine, for example, the entrapment temperature and pressure at which this, these garnets formed. Now, what I want to focus on for this first part of this talk is diffusion profiles in garnets. So elemental diffusion profiles in garnet can be used to determine um, the duration of movement along shear zones. So this is great to determine, for example, um, the time scale or the, the duration of uh, earthquake events for, for one. Um, so the study that I'm showing here is a study by Camacho et al. in 2009. So in this study, um, they were looking at calcium and iron diffusion profiles in uh, relict garnet porphyroclasts from the Musgrave block in Central Australia. So the two images here on the left, uh, these are electron microprobe maps uh, showing the distribution of calcium. So the warmer colors represent regions that are enriched in calcium, and then the cooler colors represent regions that are uh, depleted in calcium or relatively poor in calcium. And what we notice here is that we have these uh, compositional gradients along the rims, so with the rims being more calcium rich than the cores of the, gar of the garnets. And by integrating both the length scale of these uh, gradients with the diffusion coefficient for calcium or iron, um, we can then model the duration of movement along these high strain shear zones that the garnets were sampled from. Um, this model, however, um, it is based on the assumption that the dominant diffusion mechanism that causes these concentric uh, chemical variations is volume diffusion. However, um, more recent studies are starting to show more and more that um, both brittle and crystal plastic deformation can occur in garnet at high temperatures and low strain rates. So the brittle to brittle ductile transition zone for garnets is thought to be somewhere between 640 degrees Celsius to 750. Um, and here I'm showing images from a study from Haviman et al. Uh, in 2019. Um, so these are also garnet porphyroclasts uh, or granulite facies garnet porphyroclasts from the Musgrave block. Um, and we can clearly see in this EBSD map that there is evidence of crystal plastic deformation. So the, again, the warmer colors here represent um, increased misorientation relative to the grain average. And if we focus on this bottom map here, which is a misorientation map of the uh, garnet porphyroclast, we notice that there is, again, um, a heterogeneous misorientation pattern. And if we take a composition profile of calcium across this porphyroclast. So this is here in uh, figure E. We notice that the regions with the highest misorientations also coincide with regions that are enriched in calcium. So since this study, there have been other studies as well that have shown that compositional variations in garnet um, can be observed in association with uh, deformation-induced mic microstructures. Um, and even though this has been shown uh, in many different studies, the mechanisms of diffusion um, that lead to this element mobility during crystal plasticity uh, still remain poorly understood. So I just wanted to take a moment and talk about the various diffusion mechanisms that can occur in minerals. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the first one, so volume diffusion. Um, and so this mechanism is when ions or atoms migrate through the crystal lattice of a mineral. And this typically occurs in response to gradients in the chemical potential. So for volume diffusion to occur, however, we require relatively high temperatures. So usually these temperatures need to exceed temperatures at which the mineral can start to anneal. Um, under relative under lower temperature and in the presence of crystal defects, however, um, high diffusivity pathway or pipe diffusion most likely dominates. Um, so high diffusivity pathway diffusion is when atoms or ions are migrating along high diffusivity pathways within the mineral. 
And again, this is in response to gradients in the chemical potential. So these high diffusivity pathways can be uh, any type of crystalline defects, so dislocations, dislocation arrays, or what would be low angle grain boundaries, um, high angle grain boundaries, fractures, or phase boundaries as well. Uh, the third mechanism here um, is dislocation impurity pair or dip diffusion. This is probably the least understood uh, mechanism of all three, um, most likely because it, it occurs at a very small scale and we need um, very high spatial resolution techniques to be able to, to show or to document this mechanism. Um, so this is usually when atoms or ions are entrained by migrating dislocations. Um, so usually dislocations uh, have a strain field around them and this strain field attracts, uh, attracts solutes into their core. And then during dislocation creep processes, um, the atoms or the dislocations can entrain the solutes with them. And then this can lead to um, their enrichment along crystal defects such as low angle grain boundaries, for example. Um, you might have heard of the term Cottrell atmosphere. So this simply means um, solute enrichment along dislocation cores. So as I mentioned, to document or to discern between these various diffusion mechanism, um, we, we need to apply a correlative approach that involves high spatial resolution microscopy techniques. So in my research, um, I like to take a two-step approach. Um, so the first step is sample characterization and microstructural analysis. So to do this, I combine electron backscatter diffraction mapping or EBSD and electron channeling contrast imaging. So EBSD and ECCI uh, allow me to obtain both uh, quantitative and qualitative information about the deformational state of the sample um, at the micro scale, and it allows me to target regions of interest for further analysis at the nanoscale. So for the second step, um, for the nanoscale structural and geochemical analysis of these regions of interest, uh, I typically combine transmission electron microscopy techniques, so either TEM or STEM uh, in combination with EDS or EELS mapping. And more commonly, I use uh, atom probe tomography. So I think most of you are probably familiar with the techniques uh, that I mentioned on the last slide, um, but you're maybe not as familiar with atom probe tomography as it is only recently becoming more and more popular in geosciences. So I thought I would take uh, a moment to, to give you a bit more information about atom probe tomography. So APT um, is a tool that is used for the 3D imaging and chemical composition measurements of various materials at the near atomic scale. So the, the benefits of APT is that uh, we get this third dimension in our chemical and structural data, um, and it has a very high mass resolution. So we can get to detection ranges of about 10 ppm. Um, however, the downside with APT is that we do have a lower spatial resolution than TEM. Uh, this is most likely, this is more or so due to uh, ion trajectory aberrations during the analysis. So for atom probe tomography, um, we first need to prepare our specimens into a needle shape. And this is typically done through focused ion beam milling. Um, and once we have our needle, we can put it into the atom probe and we, sub we can subject it to an electrostatic field. And we do so by applying a DC voltage. So once we've established the, uh, created the electrostatic field at the tip of the specimen, we then, uh, at least in the case of insulating mater materials, um, as most minerals are, um, we then superimpose this field with laser pulses. And um, this induces the field evaporation of ions on the surface of the specimen. So once these ions evaporate, they are then projected onto a time-resolved position-sensitive detector. So what we get at the end of this is we have time of flight mass spectrometry and we have 3D spatial coordinates for each ion that was detected. So if we combine these, we can then recreate a 3D point cloud um, of our initial specimen. 
Okay, so today I will talk about um, two of my recent projects. So the first project, um, I wanted to investigate the mechanisms of element mobility during high strain deformation under dry lower crustal conditions. So for this study, I uh, looked at naturally deformed garnet porphyroclasts. Uh, these porphyroclasts were hosted in an eclogite facies myelinite that was sampled from the Musgrave block in Central Australia. And the peak conditions for the sample were estimated at 650 degrees Celsius and 1.2 gigapascal. So these samples are actually the same samples that were used in the study that I showed previously by Camacho et al. that uh, looked at diffusion profiles. So as I mentioned, I first start with the microstructural analysis. Um, so if we look here at the BSC image of these porphyroclasts, we, no we notice that they are strongly fractured. Um, they are hosted in a quartz feldspathic matrix. Um, and they are overgrown by these smaller neocrystallized garnet grains. Um, so once we've mapped these porphyroclasts uh, with electron microprobe, here I'm only showing the map for calcium. Um, again, we notice that there are uh, chemical variations within the porphyroclasts. Um, more noticeably, there are uh, the neocrystallized grains are strongly enriched in calcium. So the warmer colors again are, represent uh, enrichment in calcium, whereas the cooler colors represent depletion. Um, and in addition to these calcium enriched uh, neocrystallized grains, we also notice that the porphyroclasts have um, calcium enriched rims. I then um, did EBSD mapping on the same porphyroclast, which is shown here on the right. So from the EBSD map here, this is a misorientation and grain boundary map. So the warmer colors in this map represent uh, regions of increased misorientation relative to the grain average, and the, the low, uh, cooler colors represent um, minimal misorientation. And um, the grain boundaries are shown with these pink and red lines. And what we notice in this map is that uh, we do have evidence of crystal plasticity in the sample, um, and this is in the form of heterogeneous misorientation patterns, as well as low angle grain boundary development at the, at the rim of some of these porphyroclasts here. Now, what's more important to notice, however, is that if we compare the uh, electron microprobe map to the EBSD map, we notice that these more uh, strongly deformed clasts appear to be the uh, to coincide with the more calcium rich class as well. Um, so we need to keep this in mind as we keep going through these images. So here um, I wanted to take a closer look at one of these highly deformed porphyroclast. So once again, this is a misorientation in green boundary map. And I looked at uh, the region here of increased misorientation in the, the white square. Um, with electron channeling contrast imaging. So these three images here are ECCI. And um, what we notice from these images is that this region of increased misorientation has a high density of free dislocations. So these free dislocations are shown with the white arrows, as well as there's a high density of low angle grain boundaries. So these low angle grain boundaries here are pointed to with the black arrows, and they can basically consist of aligned uh, dislocation walls. So based on these images, I selected a region along one of these low angle grain boundaries for analysis with atom probe tomography. So here I show uh, the APT data of this specimen. Um, the video or animation on the left is the a APT reconstruction uh, where all of the gray pixels are silicon ions. And then the uh, purple envelopes are regions that were enriched or relatively enriched in calcium. So what we notice from this reconstruction is that calcium appears to be enriched in these linear tubular features. Um, and based on the location of the specimen lift out, I interpreted these to be dislocations. Um, we also noticed that these dislocations are along the same plane. Um, so this is indicative that they are, in fact, uh, dislocations that are part of a low angle grain boundary. So if we take composition profiles across these dislocations, so these are the profiles shown here, um, we notice that these 
dislocations are in fact enriched in calcium, but we also noticed that they are depleted in magnesium. So based on this data, um, it's obvious that the main or the dominant diffusion mechanism for calcium in the specimen is not volume diffusion. So this leaves us with two options, either pipe diffusion or dip diffusion. Um, but to determine this, we'll, we will uh, come back to it a bit later. But first, I wanted to compare this uh, to specimens that were taken along a less deformed porphyroclast. So for this reason, I chose this porphyroclast here. So once again, it's a fractured porphyroclast in a quartz feldspathic matrix. If we take a closer look here in a high contrast BSC image of the rim of this porphyroclast, um, we don't notice any grayscale gradients or contrast orientation contrast values. So this is indicative that there isn't much crystal plasticity within the sample. Um, however, we do have these partial, partially healed microfractures where the, the healed portion of the fractures are highlighted by um, these bright contrasts. So the, these bright contrasts are indicative that um, there might be element segregation of a heavier species along these structures. So once again, if we look at the micropro map of calcium, uh, these, garnet, these garnet crystals or grains are also enriched, uh, also have a calcium enriched rim. Uh, one thing that's noticeable is that this rim here is in fact much thinner than the calcium rims that we found in the other porphyroclasts. And then if you look at the EBSD misorientation and grain boundary map of this porphyroclast, um, there's almost no evidence of crystal plastic deformation here. So the maximum misorientation was around the smaller neocrystallized grains, um, but the average misorientation of the entire grain here, um, I believe, was less than 0.6 degrees. So because of this, um, I selected two, uh, or I prepared two specimens along the rim of this garnet porphyroclast. The first, so APT1, the first specimen was taken slightly closer to the calcium enriched rim, whereas um, specimen two, APT2, was taken a bit more inwards, closer to the core. So I looked, uh, I wanted to do APT on these two to try and determine the diffusion mechanism in this um, almost undeformed uh, porphyroclast. So here's the APT data for both of these specimens. Um, what, once again, the gray ions are silicon, whereas the purple envelopes are calcium. So we notice in both of these specimens that we do have a planar structure at the top of them that is enriched in calcium. Um, based on the location, however, of, this, uh, of these two specimens, based on the BSC images, I interpreted these two to be um, the healed microfractures that we documented. And if we look at a composition profile across these features, we notice that not only are they enriched in calcium, but they're also enriched in magnesium and in iron. But more importantly, we need to look at the rest of the matrix within, um, within these two specimens, which was completely, um, so both calcium and silicon and all of the other major components of garnet were completely homogeneously distributed within the matrix. And um, if we looked at the calcium relative calcium composition between these two specimens, uh, we noticed that calcium is, uh, the calcium composition of specimen one is slightly higher than the calcium composition of specimen two, which is what we expect. So based on the fact that there is no evidence of crystal plastic microstructures within these specimens, so no dislocations or low angle grain boundary, um, I am proposing that the main diffusion mechanism in these samples is in fact volume diffusion. Um, however, if we come back to the specimen with the dislocations from the more strongly deformed porphyroclast, um, like I said, uh, we have two options, either dip diffusion or pipe diffusion. So for dip diffusion to occur, um, dislocations need to be migrating uh, under dislocation creep processes and um, would, then they would entrain 
the calcium enriched dislocations to form the low angle grain boundaries. However, in this, uh, in this specimen, uh, the low angle grain boundaries were most likely formed as a result of kink like bending um, of the crystal lattice due to fracturing rather than by dynamic recrystallization processes. Um, in addition to this, for dip diffusion to occur, calcium would have needed to be sourced from uh, the garnet grain itself. However, in the study by Camacho et al, um, they actually suggested that the recrystallization of the granulite facies plagioclase within the host rock matrix to a more sodic phase uh, led to the liberation of calcium, which was then free to diffuse into the, the rims of these calcium porphyroclasts, uh, of these garnet porphyroclasts. So based on these two observations, so we know the calcium is sourced externally. We know the low angle grain boundaries were formed due to fracturing rather than dynamic recrystallization. Then the most likely model for or mechanism for diffusion in these porphyroclasts is pipe diffusion. So this uh, schematic down here just shows a bit the, the history of the sample. So we start with a pristine garnet um, in a quartz feldspathic matrix. And then during high strain deformation, the matrix deforms ductally, forming this myelinitic um, texture. Yet the strong garnet uh, deforms brittly. And at the edges of these fragments, we have the development of low angle grain boundaries due to the, the bending of the crystal lattice. Um, so these low angle grain boundaries act as high diffusivity pathways for calcium. And then the intake of calcium leads to uh, iron and magnesium uh, diffusing out of the crystal to make space for calcium. So if we take a closer look at these low angle grain boundaries, once the calcium is segregated into the low angle grain boundary, instead of being distributed homogeneously, the calcium is attracted to the strain field of the dislocations, leading to their segregation along the dislocation course, as we observed in APT. So our data is actually very similar to a recently published study by Taketo et al. 2022. Um, they also combined EBSD and APT on uh, granulite facies garnets from the Linda Snap. And um, in their study, they, uh, they targeted a low angle grain boundary and they interpreted this low angle grain boundary to have formed due to dislocation creep and dynamic recrystallization processes. Um, so when they took, looked at the APT specimen from this low angle grain boundary, they noticed enrichment in calcium, titanium, phosphorus, uh, copper, um, potassium, sodium, chloride, and hydrogen along this low angle grain boundary. And for the first four elements here, um, they interpreted this to be their segregation to be due to dislocation and purity pair diffusion. So the reason for their interpretation was that um, these, these four elements are commonly found in garnet, and therefore they could have uh, they could have diffused into the dislocations and then be entrained into the low angle grain boundary. However, for the other four elements, so um, these are uh, elements that are commonly found in um, aqueous brines um, of subduction regions, and so they attributed their segregation to fluid mediated high diffusivity pathway diffusion. So even though our data is very similar, there are a few differences. So they documented two different diffusion mechanisms, whereas we only documented one. Um, so here I'm trying to um, explain maybe why that is. So the main difference between their uh, garnet samples and the, the garnet samples from the Musgrave block is that the, the samples from Norway were deformed in the presence of fluids as well as they were deformed at higher temperatures of 800 to 900 degrees Celsius uh, as compared to the 650 degrees Celsius from the Musgrave block. So it's well known that the presence of fluids in silicate minerals can soften minerals, and this is typically done through hydrolytic weakening. Um, so during this process, uh, the strong silicon oxygen bonds are converted to weaker hydrogen bonds, and this facilitates dislocation creep processes and dynamic recrystallization. Therefore, 
the presence of fluids and the higher temperatures of the garnets in the snap most likely led to the forming of low angle grain boundaries via subgrain rotation recrystallization and allowed for element mobility via dip and pipe diffusion. Whereas in the musgrave block, these garnets were deformed under dry conditions and lower temperatures. Therefore, the low angle grain boundaries in the sample are most likely fracture related, and therefore element mobility is only possible via pipe diffusion and not dip diffusion. So based on all of this data, it's obvious that garnet may not be as strong as we think. Um, so for this next project that I wanna talk about today, um, I investigated the mechanisms of fracture in garnet under lower crustal conditions. So for this study, I applied the same analytical approach on the same samples. But before I show you some data, um, looking at fracturing or weakening mechanisms in garnets becomes important in the context of earthquakes. So I just want to give a bit of background on earthquakes. So as we know, uh, there are two major settings on Earth where earthquakes can nucleate, um, either along plate boundaries or along diffuse networks of faults within continental interiors. So I like to show this histogram here because it clearly shows that earthquakes along continental interiors are associated to a lot more deaths than earthquakes along uh, plate boundaries. The main reason for this is because continental interiors are more densely populated than plate boundaries. Um, however, even though these intracontinental earthquakes pose a greater risk, risk to society, the mechanisms of earthquake nucleation and their mechanisms of propagations are still poorly understood. Um, therefore, um, oh, and since the, the lower crust is dominated by ductile deformation, we need to investigate the microstructures within higher strength minerals, such as garnet, to better understand the mechanisms of mechanical failure at depths. So this is what I tried to do in this project here. Um, so once again, I combined EBSD mapping and high contrast BSC imaging or ECCI imaging on these garnet porphyroclasts. Uh, for, for this, I wanna focus on this porphyroclast here, so if we look at the inverse pole figure map, we notice that there is a band of smaller grains uh, with a large scatter of orientation at the center of this porphyroclast. So all of these small grains are concentrated along these fractures that are highlighted in white. And then if you turn your attention at the misorientation map here, we notice that these smaller grains have uh, no evidence of lattice distortion. So they have no misorientations within them. And then looking at the grain boundary map of this same porphyroclast, we notice that these small grains are in fact outlined by high angle grain boundaries. Um, and um, this intrigued me. And so I looked at these small grains with high contrast BSC imaging. So you can see these small grains in the two images here below. Um, what we notice from these images is that these, uh, these small grains have curved grain boundaries. There is microcracking at these grain boundaries. And then uh, we also notice that they are highlighted by this high contrast, which is again indicative of chemical segregation. So all of these observations together are indicative that these small grains formed as a result of cataclysis, followed by subsequent recrystallization by grain boundary migration. So to study the, the weakening mechanisms, I wanted to have a better look at one of these high angle grain boundaries. And so I prepared a specimen along one of them to look at or analyze with APT. So here I'm showing the 3D reconstruction of this specimen. Uh, in this case, I'm showing the distribution of iron atoms, which are all of these pink dots. And what we notice in this specimen is that on one side of it, iron appears to be completely homogeneously distributed. Uh, but on the other side of it, iron seems to form these equally spaced um, arrays of nanoclusters. So if we take a composition profile across some of these clusters, just shown here, uh, we notice that these clusters are mostly enriched in calcium and not really any of the other elements. 
So these results are strikingly similar to what has already been observed in nano-engineered metallic alloys. So here I'm giving an example where precipitation hardening was done on um, a iron-based alloy that was doped with titanium, molybdenum, and vanadium. So during this treatment process, the material is heated to high temperatures, in this case, 1200 degrees Celsius. And then during cooling, um, there's a phase transformation from the high temperature FCC structure to a low temperature BCC structure. Um, so during this phase transformation, it leads to the continuous nucleation and then subsequent detachment of precipitates that form along this moving heterophase boundary. So this leads us with a final configuration of finely dispersed and equally spaced planar arrays of precipitates like we observed in our garnet specimen. So there are two main mechanisms by which dislocations can move through such obstacles. Uh, the first is the Aroan mechanism. So this is when dislocations loop around the obstacles by bowing. And the second is the arts rosler wilkinson mechanism, which is when dislocations migrate through obstacles during creep process. Um, so both of these mechanisms require relatively higher amounts of energies and stresses, and therefore this can lead to the hardening of the material, which is the desired effect in the case of uh, nano-engineered alloys. So based on this literature and our observations, I came up with a new precipitation hardening model in garnets. So in this, in this model, we start with grain boundary migration during recrystallization. Once the grain boundary migrates, iron starts to segregate along this, this boundary and leaves behind an iron depleted zone. Uh, once the grain, if the boundary continues to migrate and accumulate more iron, it will eventually reach a point of saturation. And at that point, uh, iron clusters will start to nucleate along the boundary and then will start to detach from this boundary. And if this process continues, we are left with these equally spaced arrays of nanoclusters. Now, if, like in the case of precipitates, these iron clusters act as obstacles for migrating dislocations, further uh, deformation of the sample will lead, of the garnet will lead to dislocation pinning and entanglement at these clusters. And this can then lead to microcrack nucleation along these uh, dislocation tangles. So by applying correlative microscopy on garnets so far, I've been able to make two significant discoveries. Um, that I've shown you today. So the, the first is that crystal plasticity in garnet can lead to the enhanced mobility of trace and major elements. And this brings into question the reliability of garnet as a petrological tool. So especially this is especially true in the case of higher strain conditions where garnet is deformed um, plastically. The second discovery is that strain hardening can occur in garnets. And this potentially explains the mechanism of mechanical failure in the deeper crust uh, that leads to the nucleation and propagation of earthquakes. So I know this is a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Um, so I hope that you, what you take away from this presentation is that processes documented at the nanoscale within minerals can provide us with information that's essential to understand larger tectonic scale processes on Earth. So this was actually stated a while ago in 1894 by Rafael Pompeli, where he observed that small structures are key to and mimic the styles and orientations of larger structures of the same generation within a particular area. In this case, he was talking about small macro scale structures um, relative to tectonic scale structures. However, now with uh, technique developments, we can now look at these same structures at the nanoscale, and I think we need to extract as much information as we can from them. So thank you so much for uh, listening to me today. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank my PhD advisor, David Schneider, and then my collaborators who helped me with this work on Garnet. So Betsy's Go, uh, Stefan Zeiferer, both from MPIE, and Alfredo Camacho from the University of Manitoba.